little bit from the plan I suggested, the kind of Neil and me suggested yesterday. So instead of doing tutorial first and then lecture, I think it will be easier for me at least to do the lecture first, right, and then the tutorials. I hope you don't mind. So this is sort of the second part of strategic behavior in elections lecture. So the first part was manipulation, and this is the second part. Okay, so to give you a broad overview, so strategic behavior in elections is typically classified into three types. So first is manipulation, and this is kind of strategic behavior by voters, voters changing their preferences, reporting their preferences insincerely, individually, or in groups to get better outcomes. Right, so, another, so the second one, and that's one we'll cover today, is control. And this is, uh, think of it as election authority trying to change the election outcome. Someone who is organizing the election. So what type of things do this co does this cover? Well, for one thing, adding or deleting voters. So mathematically, of course, it's easy to think about kind of how you add or delete voters. What it corresponds in practical terms is, you know, get out the vote effort, kind of going out and campaigning, you know, not for or against a specific candidate, but just trying to bring specific groups of people whom you expect to vote in a specific way to actually attend the election. Say, send a bus uh, to whatever local, <coughs> kind of local, 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 local club for university students or for elderly people because you have certain beliefs about how these groups are going to vote. Okay, or adding or deleting candidates, again, this is an option. Um, so adding, adding candidates, for instance, to split the vote of your opponent, this is something that is very much done in practice. So there's a brilliant story, actually, how um, a Republican party in the states, in some state, actually recruited a homeless guy to run on sort of the Democratic platform uh, with the hope that it will split away at least some votes from the Democratic candidate. It actually was a closely contested election, so the even splitting of just a few votes would already be useful. Okay, so adding, adding or deleting candidates. So some other flavors that I'm going to talk about. So broadly, okay, so unlike manipulation, control is just a broad set of actions in changing the structure of the election. So you can even argue that maybe tweaking the voting room can be seen as a control action. So we'll see another control action that's called cloning. Right, so this is sort of general legal actions. And in a second group, it's actually this whole bribery. So that's an external actor trying to change the election outcome by bribing voters. Okay, so bribery is well defined. So someone comes in, kind of pays the voters to change their opinions. Right, and maybe voters can be bought wholesale you buy a voter to change their opinion altogether, or maybe you bribe voter depending on how much you want them to change their opinion. So there are all these flavors. So we won't talk much about it, but we'll talk about it briefly towards the end. Okay, so all of these, like manipulation, can be constructive or destructive. We may be promoting the preferred candidate or trying to harm a despised candidate. So they can be unique winner or poor winner. So we may be aiming to make someone the unique winner of the election under given rule or one of the many election winners. Or, and it can be weighted or unweighted, right? So all these flavors are relevant to all three, right? So we talked about it in the context of manipulation. We'll talk also about them a bit in the context of control. Okay, so let me start with a specific example to give you a flavor of what computation looks like. Okay, let me define control by adding candidates. So the input here is first we have set of candidates, kind of these are the set of candidates that are in the election to start with, our base candidates, and then we have a set of additional candidates. These are the candidates that our election authority may be able to recruit to participate in the election. We have voters, and voters have preferences over the joint set of candidates. So when they rank candidates, they implicitly rank kind of all the candidates in age, right? So if they so depending on what set of candidates actually runs in the election, they report their preferences over the sets of candidates who are running, but in terms of kind of what preference they actually have, they have rankings for the entire set C union A. And we have a parameter K. And a special candidate P, whom we want to make the election winner. Right, so I'm in a constructive case, <laughs> and kind of in some cases, I will be talking about the poor winner problem. So the question now is the following. Do we have a set of additional candidates of size at most k, such that our preferred candidate is a poor winner in the profile restricted to his size? So poor winner meaning one of the many. Okay. Can we recruit more candidates so as to make p win? 
Well, for one thing, it depends on our budget. Okay, so we have three votes in favor of D. We have somehow turned these two votes. Okay, so P, okay, so kind of to move more slowly, P now has just one vote. To make him an election co-winner, we must make sure that everyone has at most one vote. So can we enforce that? Right, well, we have to take away two votes from D, and we have to be careful that by doing so, we don't give two votes to any of the new candidates. And we have to take away one vote from B. So he turns out that if we actually recruit all the candidates who are present, E, A, and C, then we end up, okay, so what do we, what do we end up with here? So it's still P, E, B, A, B, C, so we cannot, right? Just because B is twice on top, right? And under some other circumstances, maybe we could, right? So generally, so if you think about it, kind of, if you think about what we have to do is, okay, so we recruit new candidates to block old candidates from being on top to reduce their scores. We have to be careful so as not to remove points from our preferred candidates. This is something that a new candidate may do. We also have to be careful not to give too many points to any of the new candidates, right? And maybe if we recruit a new candidate and they become dangerous, we can then recruit another new candidate to take away points from that new, from the previous candidate, right? So it, become, it looks like a complicated scheme, even under plurality. So I think this intuition suggests that maybe it's not an easy problem, and in fact, it's one of those few problems that actually NP hot even for plurality. And, well, it's a cute proof, and I have cute slides by Pyotr Fleshevsky for it, so I want to show those. Okay, so the problem we are going to reduce from, we are going to show NP hardness, we are going to reduce from exact cover by three sets. Okay, to remind you in exact cover by three sets, we have a base set, ground set, of size that is a multiple of k, or multiple of three, three k, and we have n subsets that are all of size three. And the question then is whether it's possible to pick k sets from this set and cover all of B, right? So visually, so this is my set B, colored dots. So these are my subsets, kind of various triples, and I want to cover all of B, right? So in this particular case, can I cover all of B? Well, I can if I take S3 and S4, so that exactly covers all of B. And know that the cover here would be an exact cover, so if you want to cover, if you pick K sets, of size three, and our goal is to cover three K elements, so we'll be covering them without overlaps. Okay, so how does it map onto an instance of our problem? It's a fairly simple construction, so let me show it to you. So I'm going to construct a candidate uh, for each element of the ground set. So for each of these dots, there is a candidate. And there will also be a candidate for each of the sets. So red guy for the first set, so green lady for the second, blue guy for the third, Okay, so these are the additional candidates. So there's a candidate per element of the ground set, and there's a candidate per each of these sets. Okay, so what, here's what I do next. For each, so for each set like that, I construct three votes, right? So three votes, these three votes go like this. So first, the candidate associated with the set, then an element of the set. Candidate associated with the set, second element. Candidate associated with the set, third element. Right, so three voters like that. And I do that for every set. Okay, so I do that for every set. So, so this is kind of, okay, so this is the first set of voters I construct. So now I have to tell you which candidates are the actual candidates, candidate in C, and which ones are additional candidates. So I make it so that the candidates here, the base candidates, so these are my real candidates, this is my set C, and these new candidates, kind of the little persons, are additional candidates. So let me fade them out. I hope you can still see them. So they faded out a bit too much, but they're still there. So you can see the trace. Okay, so now let's look at this election. So this election, not everyone yet has the same. Okay, so I didn't tell you who my preferred candidate is. In fact, he's not in the picture. So this will be one additional candidate. So I have these guys and one more preferred candidate, right? And at this point, all these colored candidates may possibly have different scores. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to add further votes for each of them. So I'm going, okay, so let me look at this. So here I have three votes ranking green guy first. If I ignore the additional candidate, just look at the basic ones. I have three votes ranking the green guy first, three votes ranking the blue guy first, but for the purple, it's just two. So I, I add additional votes so that all of them have the same number of votes. So in this case, I can, in this case, I can add one vote 
let's say I add 10 votes for 10 votes for purple, nine votes for blue, nine votes for green. I want it to be a largish number. So say, but yeah, 10 will do. Ten, so 10, 10 new votes for purple, so nine for blue, nine for green, so that each of them have the same number of votes. And then I have an additional candidate, P, and he has one less vote, right? So this is not my entire profile. So I have these votes. So I have additional votes that rank one of these guys first and everyone else below, including the additional candidates. Additional candidates go somewhere to the bottom. And I have T votes that just rank P first. So then after that, I have these scores. Okay, so suppose I have that. So what's happening here? So I want my candidate P to be a co-winner of the election. But there are all these candidates, all these base candidates that actually prevent him from doing so. So I want to take away a point from each of them. So let me set my bribery budget, not sorry, my control budget, so the number of candidates, the number of additional candidates I can introduce to be this K. Right, so I can now introduce K of these little people candidates. Right, so that's the game. So when I introduce a little person candidate, that little person gets three points. So therefore I wanted kind of the score of P to be more than three. I said I had kind of 10 candidates of each type. So for P, so P now has some larger score like 10, 12, 10, 12, 13, whatever. So T, so think of T as being kind of largish, 10, 11. Okay, so when I add a little person, this little person gets three points. So the little person himself is not threatening. And the little person takes away a point from each of the candidates he now covers. So if I introduce the red guy, so he, he takes away one point from the blue guy, one point away from the purple, one point away from the, from the gray. Right, so if I were to introduce all the little people, then it would be just little people having three points each and my candidate would be the winner. But I cannot introduce all the little people, right? Because there are potentially a lot of them and my budget is K. I can only introduce K of the little people. So how should I choose the little people? Well, I should choose the ones that provide an exact cover, right? I should choose ones corresponding to sets that provide exact cover. Because if I have that, if I have little people providing an exact cover of the ground set, then that means exactly each set is covered once. So like here, this means I take away one point. Okay, so let's see again what happens. So I added little people and plus one disappeared, right? So I, I took away one point from each of these candidates thereby reducing the score to T. And I did that within my budget, right? And obviously the converse is also true. If I managed to take away one point from all of these three K guys, so this means I introduced K new candidates which correspond to a cover, right? So this construction means that kind of control by adding candidates is exactly as hard as exact cover by three sets, right? So by the way, okay, so it should be easy to see that control by adding candidates, let me flash back to the formal definition of the problem. Ah, this is slow. Okay, so it should be easy to see that this is in NP. So does someone want to argue why this is in NP? So suppose, okay, so how do you, okay, so how, how do, so this is a yes no question, is there a subset? So suppose you're given a subset, so how, how do you verify? Just check, yeah, right. So you have, yeah, so to, 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 the problem is in NP because you can guess this subset and you verify that P is a covenant profile. So for every polynomial time computable voting rule for plurality in particular, this is in NP. Okay, so that was controlled by adding candidates. So that was hard even for plurality. So I guess you won't be surprised if I tell you that it's hard for any reasonable voting rule, right? Then there are results of that sort in the literature. So I'm not going to spend more time on this problem. So because it's hot, it's hot in this setting. So you can ask if it remains hot for restricted domains. I'm not sure, but I think there may be results of that flavor. I wouldn't bet on it, but I think there are. You can ask about parameterized complexity. So you can think of a few reasonable parameters in that setting. I, there may or may not be some research of that flavor. I'm hesitant because, okay, so there's a lot of literature on control. So I have a hard time remembering kind of which results are for which control problem. But generally, okay, so it's hard even for plurality. So you can explore several ways of making it easy. Okay, let me now talk, just to show you the differences, let me talk about a different control problem. And that's control by adding voters, right? So first, in the previous one, we're adding candidates, now we're adding voters. Okay, 
So it's sort of symmetric. So now we have a set of candidates that have, we are not going to change. We have a set of voters, and we have a set of additional voters. So voters V come to the election for sure. Voters U may or may not show up, right? So it's our job to recruit them. And we only have K buses to send out, so we can bring in K of these candidates. So we have parameter K, and we have special candidate P. And again, our goal is to recruit at most K, so at most K additional voters, to make P is a core winner. Okay, so one was recruiting candidates, the other one is recruiting voters. Now this one, interestingly, is a much easier problem. Okay, so let's think of it, let's think about this for a second. So let's suppose that our voting rule is plurality, right? So suppose you are facing this in a practical scenario. You have an election that is run according to plurality. You want to make certain candidate a winner, right? And you can bring in, you can bring in at most K new voters. So what do you do? Yeah, so you, you check if you have K voters, you actually rank that guy first. If you do, you bring them, either that works or not, right? If you have fewer, you bring whoever you have, right? So you don't bring anyone who doesn't vote for your guy because there is no point. If your voters are weighted, what do you do? Right, so voters now may have weights. Yeah, you still bring kind of K guys who vote, K guys who vote for your candidate, you bring K heaviest guys, right? Okay, so plurality, okay, so again, to illustrate, okay, so the colors are not showing properly, uh, so the two guys on the right are actually not white, but very pale blue. So this blue is considerably darker on my screen, right? So these are the two additional voters. So suppose initially you have these four voters on the left, right? So you want to make A a winner, so ties are broken lexicographically, so then to make A a winner, so you can bring in the A candidate, the fifth candidate, right? So that's pretty simple. Okay, so like I said, okay, plurality is easy even with weighted votes. So in fact, it goes beyond that. So it remains easy for two approval. Remember, two approval is the voting rule where each voter has to approve exactly two candidates. Yes? Uh, okay, it's a very good point. No, we do know the preference in advance, right? So this is just some pool of voters sitting, sitting away from us. We fully know their preferences, right? So like in that picture, right? So they are, they are sort of different, kind of different colors are sitting aside, but we know who they are, right? And if we don't, this becomes very similar to another problem we discussed, so I'll bring that up. Okay, so now to approval. So if you think of it, you can think of potential new votes as just pairs. P is consisting of two candidates, right? And if there's a new vote, potential new vote, potential added vote, that doesn't rank your preferred candidate in two, top two positions, there's no point in recruiting him. You don't have to bring in K people, you can bring in less, so you don't want to bring guys that don't help your candidate at all. Okay, so now you can look at these pairs, so you can say that your budget is minimum of your actual budget K and useful votes, votes that rank your guy in top K positions. Right, so let's say this S, right? So S is the maximum number of votes you can get for your guy, right? And, but now there's a trade-off, right? If you can try to get all these votes for your guy, but in doing so, you're also giving extra votes to some other guys. Okay, so if you think about it, okay, so if you think about it even more carefully, it actually doesn't matter, uh, but so just for simplicity, kind of, let me, kind of let me analyze it in this fashion. So let me decide how many voters to add. And it can be any number between zero and S, right? Again, if you think about it more carefully, there is actually no harm adding all of them because kind of, but okay, let's, let's make that a homework exercise, why there's no harm adding all of them. But for now, let's say I'm adding Q. So I'm deciding how many I want to add. I'm going over all possibilities. So I'm now trying to add Q. So suppose I added Q. So what happens now? So for each candidate, let's say that SC is the score before any of the new voters are added. Okay, so what do we do now? We have added Q voters. Each of these Q voters give an extra point to our guy. So our guy's score is now SP plus Q, right? Okay, so how many, can, how many of the votes PC we can add to see some other guy? Well, uh, so we want to make sure that the P's final score is at most, uh, we want to make sure that C's final score is at most P's final score. Right, so we, if we can add at most that many vo votes, 
rank C in top two position, then this is C. And of course, if this number happens to be negative, this means that we have already lost, right? So we brought in Q voters who rank P first, but yet at that point, some other guy still already has more votes, right? So even if you don't add any new votes that rank C in top two position, C already has more votes, right? So this guess doesn't work, so we have to give up. Okay, but yeah, so assuming all these numbers are actually non-negative, so then we have a budget kind of for votes of this type. Right, so we can bring that many votes that say PA, that many votes that say PB, that many votes that say PC, and our goal now is to find Q votes in top two. Right, and we have constraints on how many votes of each type we can take, and we want to find Q votes top two. Right, and the simple greedy algorithm would do that. Right, so two approval is easy in the unweighted case. Okay, so what about weighted case? So weighted case becomes tricky because again, now okay, we want to help our guy P, Right, so again, we want to bring in kind of some, so we, was, we sort of want to bring in kind of heavy vote, votes that help him, but now we uh, think about it this way. So we may have votes of type PA, ranking P first, A second, votes PB, ranking P first, B second. Right, and A and B may already have some, some amount of vote base. Right, so when we're bringing in those guys, we have to balance it carefully so that neither A nor B get too much extra weight. Right, and that, Sounds and be hard, right? That sounds and be hard by reduction from partition. Okay, do you have a feeling of deja vu as I go through that? Does it remind you something of something we've seen yesterday? We've seen a very similar argument in the context of Kalish, of Kalishno manipulation. Okay, so in, in fact, actually control by adding voters and Kalishno manipulation are very, very similar, and this relates to what you asked, right? Okay, so in what sense are they similar? Collational manipulation, I remember we had these voters whose preferences were not specified and who wanted to make a specific candidate a winner. Right, and now we say, okay, so it's not voters, it's us, but we still want to bring in a certain number of voters and make a specific candidate a winner. So small difference is in case of collational manipulation, we have an exact number of voters. In case of control, we have to up to that number of voters, but actually kind of having more voters is not going to hurt us so that's not a major difference. What is a major difference? With Kalishno manipulation, we assume that manipulators can set their votes in whatever way they like, right? So there's complete fl flexibility there, right? Whereas in case of control, new votes have to be chosen from existing voters, right? So you've got this population, right? And you can bring them in or not, but you cannot change their votes, right? So your only choice is to bring in those existing voters, right? And these may be awkward voters. Right, maybe they don't even rank your guy first, they give him some point, points, like if you think of it in, in the context of border voting, right, so maybe they rank your preferred guy somewhere closer to the top, but they rank some other guys highly as well, right, so there may be inconvenient voters, right, so in that sense, control is harder because there's additional combinatorial structure that sets you and you have to take that into account. Okay, when I said harder, so I haven't justified it yet, it seems harder, is it formally harder? Okay, let me show you a, an example where actually control is hard and collision manipulation is easy, right? So let me make that statement formal. And I'm going to stick to K approval rules, but now my K is four. Okay, so now I'm going to think about adding voters under four approval, right? And now I'm talking about unweighted voters. So think about it this way. So here's kind of one, suppose you're trying to design an algorithm for adding voters, your voting rule is four approval, so this is one situation that you should be able to handle. Your preferred candidate has zero votes. Every other candidate has K minus one vote, right? And you have a largish budget of kind of other voters who rank your guy and some other three candidates in top three positions. So what does it mean? Well, you want your guy and okay, and let's say that your budget is K. You can bring in K new candidates. So what does it mean? If you can bring K new voters, if you can bring K new voters, you can give your guy a score of K, right? But by doing so, because every vote you bring in is a four approval vote, it gives a point to your guy and three other guys, you have to be very careful to give at most one point to each of the guys you bring in, right? If you give two extra points to anyone, they would have K plus one, so they will overshoot your guy, right? So you bring in those K votes, right? Each vote is P and three other guys, and every other candidate should get at most one vote. So which NP hard problem does it remind you of? Uh, 
right? So you have sort of bringing in the sets of size three, right? And you have to make sure these sets don't overlap. Exact cover, right? So that's exactly the problem we've seen, right? And the reduction is actually very similar to the one we've seen before, right? So it's lengthy hardness reduction from exact cover by three sets. It's very much the same reduction, possibly even simpler, right? So kind of very much the same idea. Okay. So now suppose you are dealing with Kalashnikov manipulation, right? It's sort of similar, but still slightly different. Again, for approval, right? So now your candidate P, okay. So now I'm not kind of giving myself this easy situation. I'm in a generic situation. You have your guy P, he has some number of points. You have other candidates. They have some number of points. And you have a kind of, the, your manipulation budget, the number of manipulators. So what do you do? You ask each of your manipulators to put your guy P in top, in top four positions, right? And that tells you how many points your guy P is going to have in the end, right? And then again, for every other candidate, you know how many votes for that candidate you're allowed to add, right? So you have a budget per candidate. But now the difference is you can pack those additional, those additional points into votes in whatever way you like. Okay, so you say, okay, now I'm allowed to rank A in top four positions seven times, B three times, C eight times, D five times, right? So now I can pack A, B, and C, D in top four positions kind of in different votes, just respecting these constraints. And it's easy to figure out if I can do this, right? So, so the only constraint is, so the only slight difficulty is I cannot put two votes for A, kind of two points for A into one vote. No one can vote for A twice. But apart from that, it's easy to see if I can distribute these extra points for A, B, C, D into my votes, kind of, kind of subject to constraints. So again, I'm not going through details. It's not a complete proof, but I think it's pretty clear what you should be doing. So if you want a reference for that, I can give you a reference for that. So it's a paper by Andrew Lynn from a conference called ECART 2010 anyway. So if you're curious, I can give you a reference for how to do that. So in fact, for K approval, so collisional manipulation is easy for K approval for any value of K. Right, so that's the argument. Okay, so what did it show to us? Okay, so adding voters and collisional manipulation are kind of similar, but still manipulation can be easier. And also what we've just seen is that adding voters is easier than adding candidates. Adding candidates is hard even for plurality. Adding voters is easy for plurality, weighted and unweighted. It's easy for unweighted to approval. Right, it, it's hard for weighted to approval. I didn't tell you what happens for three approval. I actually don't, I couldn't come up with a kind of algorithm or reduction from the top of my head. I'm not sure if it's in the literature. This was so easy, I basically come up with it, came up with it for the lecture. I'm sure it's in the literature as well, but I'm not sure where exactly. Right, but okay, so starting from K equals four, control by adding voters gets hard. Not sure what happens for K equals three. May or may not be known. Right, so generally, so it, it's sort of this intermediate level when you sort of add not one vote, not one candidate per vote, and one is easy, not three per vote, and three is kind of an obvious reduction from exact cover by three sets, but two, and two may be hard by a non-trivial reduction, or two may be easy by some sort of network flow type of algorithm, and I'm not sure which one is that. Okay, so I'll try to look it up later. Didn't have time for that before the lecture. Okay, so, wait, how are we doing time-wise? When, when did we actually start? Half an hour ago, right? Okay, so let me con continue a little bit about, about talking about control. So with control, okay, so with manipulation, so obviously every voting rule is vulnerable to, manip to coalitional manipulation, right? If you have enough coalitional manipulator, they can change the outcome of the election. And every voting rule is vulnerable to manipulation because give or set a trait. With control, it's different. So at least for, for, for some types of control, there are voting rules that are completely resistant to this type of control. So you may try a control action, but for a given voting rule, it just has no chance of succeeding. So let me show you a sort of trivial example that I don't like, and then let me show you a more interesting example that I actually like. Okay, so this is called immunity. If you say that a voting rule is immune to a control action, if this action cannot change the election outcome at all. And let me give you what I think is a standard example of that from the literature. So there's a voting rule called Condorcet rule, which is a slightly funny voting rule. Social choice theorists wouldn't like this rule, but computer scientists do. So what this rule does, it outputs a Condorcet winner if it exists, and otherwise it outputs nothing. 
So this is, so this outputs nothing for, is not acceptable to social choice people. Social choice people believe that the voting rule should produce an output on every input, right? So they would say, okay, so if you cannot output anything, this means you are outputting the entire set of candidates. But for the purposes of what I want to say, it's important that it outputs nothing. So this is a voting rule, outputs can do seven and it exists and nothing can help us. Okay. So my claim now is that Condorcet rule is immune to adding candidates. So, okay, so what does it mean? So I have a preferred candidate P. I want to make him an, an election winner under Condorcet rule. Know that under Condorcet rule, there's always the, if there's a winner, it's always unique. So I want to make my candidate P the Condorcet winner, the unique winner under Condorcet rule. Okay, and then it's sort of a trivial claim that I cannot accomplish that by adding candidates. Okay, why? My guy is currently not a Condorcet winner. Someone beats him. So whatever candidates I add is not going to change that, right? So in that set, in that sense, I cannot change it. I cannot change, so I cannot change the election outcome by adding candidates. So why is it important that I say output nothing? So what would happen if I said output everything? Right, so my, my voting rule outputs can do seven a, when it exists and otherwise it outputs the set of all candidates. All right. Yeah, so then, mm -hmm. yeah, so then basically I can make any candidate a core winner by kind of making, kind of ruining the Condorcet property of an election, right? So if the election didn't have a Condorcet winner, already everyone is a, is a winner. And if the election did have a Condorcet winner, who is someone other than my guy, so I can try to add a new candidate. So it, at least it's sometimes possible to add a new candidate who beats the current winner but also loses to someone so that there is no Condorcet winner whatsoever. Right, and then by the second part, everyone would be a winner. Right, so I need this awkward rule kind of to give you a simple example of immunity. So let me give you a more interesting example of immunity and also a more interesting example of a control action. Okay, so this control action is cloning, right? So cloning as a way of kind of uh, manipulating collection was proposed by Nikolaus Tiedemann, who's a social choice researcher in his paper going back to 1987. Right, so he started that paper, that's literally the first paragraph of his paper, by the following story from his life. Okay, so I can read it out loud for those who sit in the back. So Tiedemann said, when I was 12 years old, I was nominated to be treasurer of my class at school. A girl named Michelle was also nominated. I relished the prospect of being treasurer, so I made a quick calculation and nominated Michelle's best friend, Charlotte. In the ensuing election, I received 13 votes, Michelle received 12 and Charlotte received 11. So I became treasurer. So what's implicit in this story is that by nominating Charlotte, who was presumably good friends with Michelle, so probably sort of similar to Michelle, he effectively stole votes from Michelle. Right, so he, he introduced a new candidate in the election that was very similar to the existing candidate and by means of doing that split the vote and became the winner. Right, so this sort of action is kind of in voting theory is called cloning. So cloning is the term in the title of Tiedemann's paper. So in his terminology here, Michelle and Charlotte would be clones. Okay, so what is the technical definition of cloning? Well, we say that we clone a candidate if we choose a parameter k greater, greater than zero, create k new candidates in order to replace c, and then in each vote, instead of replace c with those k candidates, placed consecutively in an arbitrary order, right? So this order may change from one vote to another. So it may be, it may be completely random, but it's important that they appear together. So them appearing together means exactly that they're clones. So they're sort of indistinguishable for voters. So voters have to rank them in some fashion because voters have to submit ranked ballots. But the voters, all these candidates look so similar that effectively it's very hard to predict in which order the voters would rank the candidates. Okay, so to give you an example, so if this is my original profile, and now I clone A into A1 and A2, this is what it becomes. This is what it may become, right? So the first time I rank this two, these two copies as A1, A2, and the second one as A2, A1, right? So this is a clone, right? And kind of anything, kind of anything with order in kind of these two guys in any fashion will be a clone, and I could also create three or five or however many copies, right? So any action like that is cloning. So the question we ask, in, if we see cloning as a control action, the question we ask is, can we make a clone of, our, 
can we make our candidate or possibly a clone of our candidate, if actually clone our guy, to win the election by cloning one or more candidates, right? So the rules are we allowed to clone our guy, we are allowed to clone other guy, and our goal is still to make our candidate to be an election winner under a given voting rule. Okay. So if you think about it, okay, so can we, okay, so this is still somewhat imprecise because it doesn't tell you what I assume about voters ranking of the clone candidates. So let's say I assume worst case, right? So I create a clone, so say I create a clone of my opponent, I don't have a control over how voters are going to clone my opponent, so they all may clone him in the same day, right? So the question is, can I, can I necessarily succeed? Okay, so if you can try to think about it for plurality, for instance. So for plurality, okay, so what happens when you, for plurality, there's no point in cloning your guy, because that would be effectively splitting your vote. If you clone an opponent, if you clone an opponent who is threatening, who has more votes than you, well, you don't succeed in the worst case, because maybe every, every voter will rank, will rank those clones in the same way, A1, A2. So whatever po points your opponent A got are now going to his clone A1, right? So it won't succeed in the worst case, but if you, on the other hand, if you assume that voters rank those clones randomly, right, you may succeed, right? So half of them will rank, the, will rank A1 first, half of them rank A2 first, so effectively the score of A is cut in half. If you replace A with three clones, you cut it in three, sort of in expectation. Right, so if you introduce a lot of clones and voters rank them randomly, you can succeed. So, so under plurality, cloning can be an effective strategy. So can be assuming that your voters rank, kind of rank clones randomly. So here's an amazing fact. Under single transferable vote, cloning has no power whatsoever. So no matter which voter, no matter which candidates you clone, it will be still the original candidate or one of his clones winning the election. Okay, so what I give is still a slightly hand-waving argument. So it's basically trying to think what happens when you clone a candidate under single transferable vote. So okay, so suppose you cl clone a candidate and you're always single transferable vote. So let's think what happens when a clone of a candidate is eliminated. So you clone C into a bunch of C, C1, CK. So one of these clones, CI, is eliminated first. So what happens to the voters who ranked CI first? Right, and suppose it's not the last clone of C to be in the game. Right, so this vote transferred to some other clone. Right, it's because clones always appear in the preference rankings together. So if a clone is eliminated, right, so all the points actually go to the next clone. So they stay within the family. Right, so until the last clone of that candidate is eliminated, kind of all the votes are sort of kind of redistributed among the clones. Right, so by the time kind of you're only left with one clone of that candidate, he has exactly as many first place votes as the original candidate had in the original election. Right, and that basically means that, okay, so eliminating the candidate in the old profile corresponds to eliminating the clones of that candidate one by one in the new profile. Right, so it can be interleaved possibly with eliminating some clones of some other candidate. So the, I think the formal claim I want to make is that if in the old profile, C was eliminated before D, then in the new profile, the last clone of C will be eliminated before the last clone of D. So this is something you can prove, right? And that by induction of sorts proves that if you, if you had P as a winner in the old profile, now a clone of P wins in the new profile. So cloning accomplishes nothing. And that actually is again, is a use, very useful property of STV in practical elections. Right, because what it tells you is that parties can afford to nominate several different candidates and let the electorate choose which of the candidates of a party kind of the electorate actually prefers. Right, so the party doesn't have to make this decision. Right, so in a way, with STV, you don't need primaries because kind of, because primaries effectively select one out of many clones. Right, and STV will just kind of, you know, do that for you. Right, I think this is something that was mentioned in the UK plurality versus STV debate, but it was sort of drowned in a sort of sea of relevant argument against STV. I think this is actually an important argument in favor of STV. So STV has its shortcomings, non monotonicity being the primary one, but this is also a very strong argument in favor of it. So there aren't many other interesting voting rules that, act, that are actually kind of immune to cloning in quite the same fashion. Right, so for plurality, like I explained, 
if you if voters rank candidates randomly, right? So you may succeed. With border, you very much can succeed. So with border, in fact, cloning is very, very powerful. Because so what happens is by cloning a candidate who is ranked above your opponent, you push your opponent kind of further down to the bottom of her ranking, right? So you give you can give them much fewer points kind of in relative terms. Right, so on the border, cloning is very powerful. On the Copeland and Maximin, they still have substantial power, but STV is sort of completely immune to cloning. So that's an interesting phenomenon. Okay, so that's, so that's all I wanted to say about controls. There are other types of controls. So we considered, we talked in detail about adding voters of candidates. We didn't talk much about deleting voters and candidates, but the complexity is out there for a bunch of voting rules. So we talked about cloning. So other forms of control that are considered in the literature, partitioning of voters and candidates into several groups, kind of doing elections separately for each group and then merging results. So to me, this seems like a very far-fetched type of control, but you can also find it in the literature. So generally, papers on control tend to have big tables in them because there are these many flavors of control, destructive, constructive, weighted, unweighted, core winner, unique winner, right? So many types of control, you know, adding voters, adding candidates, deleting voters, deleting candidates, and other stuff. So some people refer to it as table filling research, which I think is not completely fair. So you end up, you end up filling large tables, but in practice, I think control is a bigger danger than manipulation, at least single voter manipulation. Single voter manipulation relies on this completely unrealistic assumption that the manipulator knows every, everyone else's preferences. Control in contrast, well, technically, it also relies on knowing preferences, but you can argue that in a really corrupt society, you can do control after the election has taken place. So certainly control by deleting voters is something you do by burning the ballots, right? And if you actually have access to ballots, again, we are talking about a very corrupt society, you may be able to do that, right? And sort of adding candidates, you may have a very good sense of how voters are going to add these new candidates. So control is something that is more of a practical problem than manipulation is. So I believe it's worth studying at least those basic types of control. Okay, so now let me talk about bribery. Okay, so first formal model. So what is the basic model of bribery? So we have voters. Now each vote has a price attached to them. So some voters are imbribable, so the price is infinity. Some voters are easy to bribe. Some voters maybe even you can bribe for free. So these prices can be anywhere between zero and plus infinity inclusive. So voters potentially also have weight. So like before, we can have weighted and unweighted case. And now in the basic model, after paying the price of a voter, we can change his vote arbitrarily, right? And we have a bribery budget. This is how much we can spend. And our goal is to make, again, a preferred candidate, an election winner, by bribing voters whose total price is at most P. Right, so this is the basic model that was introduced in the first bribery paper that Polishevsky, Hemaspontra, and Hemaspontra I think the journal version came out in 2007, the conference version a bit before that. So there are also fancier models. The, the voters' price depends on how much we change the vote. Right? And I'll talk about those very briefly, kind of after I talk about the basic model. Okay, so let's try to get a sense of a basic model. And again, again, let's consider plurality. And let's consider the simplest possible case. You need weights, you need prices. So you have a bunch of voters. Each of them you can bribe at a cost of one. You have a bribery budget B. Right, so all of them are identical in the sense they have unit weights. So how do you actually do your bribery? Okay, let me describe a simple algorithm. Okay, you can think that sort of greedy algorithm works. You should just, you know, try to buy voters who vote for P. But you can see from this picture that you shouldn't be buying just any votes. You should be sort of trying to take away votes from the dangerous candidates. Right, so from this guy and from this guy. So let me, okay. So let me explain an algorithm that does something more sophisticated than that because it will be easier to generalize to what follows. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to guess a winning score for my candidate P. Right? So let that, let, let that winning score be some level. Right? So I'm going, to say, I'm going to guess that my candidate, so if I succeed, my successful bribery will be such that that my guy P wins with S points, right? exactly S points. And everyone else therefore will have at most S points. Okay, so what do I have, once I have that guess, what do I have to do now to achieve that scenario? Well, look, I have these two dangerous other, other candidates. So I have to take away votes from them. So I have to bob, so I have to bribe, so for every dangerous candidate, I have to bribe S of C minus S voters who rank C first, and by doing that, I achieve a dual purpose. 
I take away votes from them, and when I bribe them, I don't bribe them to go away, right? So I bribe them to vote for me, right? So I take that vote rate and I move it here, and I take that vote rate and move it here. Okay, so here's what can happen. So by doing that, I can exceed my bribery budget, so maybe I cannot actually afford to bribe all these boys, and if that happens, I fail. So the other thing that can happen is that once I bribe them to vote for P, I, I overshoot my target S. Right? And since I have, a, I have a specific guess for S, so it's sort of a good situation, but since my, since my threshold is S, I say that I fail in this case. So meaning if I failed for this value of S, I should have had a different guess. Okay, so but now suppose neither of that happened. Right, and so now P, I bribed all these dangerous guys, but maybe P still doesn't have enough votes. So then I would have just to buy some additional votes for P. I buy them not because they're dangerous, but because I need more votes for P. And I can do that, so say these. And if I can do that within my budget, I'm good. Right, so that's a fairly simple algorithm. So it's more complex actually than what you need just to make P a winner. If you just need to make P a winner, you, can, you don't have to guess this threshold. You just sort of take gradually votes and transfer them to P. But this also works, right? And this is clearly polynomial type. Okay, so now let's make it more complicated. So let's look at this algorithm. So now suppose I have now vote, suppose my voters have different prices. So some voters are easy to convince to change their opinion, some voters are difficult. How do I change this algorithm? So same setting, unit weights. Okay, so let me start. So we still guess the winning score. Right, so what do I do next? So now they have prices, but I still have to take away those points from, those votes from the two threatening guys. So which votes, so I still have to take that many S minus SC votes from these guys. Right, so I need to still to bribe this many voters. Which S minus SC voters do I bribe? the cheapest ones, right? So I need to bribe that many of them, I don't have a choice, so I just go for the cheapest guys, right? So in a way, so the picture is exactly the same with the caveat that these are not just arbitrary S minus SC voters, these are the cheapest. Okay, fine. And again, if this bribe exceeds the budget, I fail, and if I overshoot, I fail. And maybe if I still need to bribe more people now, again, now I go for the cheapest remaining guys, right? So, okay. so maybe now I just cannot just grab them arbitrarily from here. So I choose the cheapest votes so at this point. I choose the cheapest votes from all the votes available to me. Doesn't matter whom these voters currently support. I just go for the cheapest guys and make them vote for P. And if this is within my budget, I win. Okay, so general prices, unit weights was easy again. Okay, so let me do one more case. So now I have unit prices, but general weights. So these can be arbitrary, but, but now each voter has a unit cost. Okay, and I still want to do something similar. Okay, so let me, okay, so let me explain an algorithm, which will be almost correct, but there will be something that is not quite right with it. So let me go through it, and then we will come back to it and see what's wrong, and then try to fix it. Okay, so that's my first attempt. I'm going, so before that, I used to guess a winning score. Now I'm going to guess a winning vote weight. So the candidate who wins has that much vote weight, kind of, has, so the total weight of voters who support him is that quantity double. Okay, so I have that. So now I'm going to do this. So for each candidate who has more vote weight, right, so for each dangerous candidate, uh, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to vote all the voters who support that guy, C by weight, from large to small, and then I'm going to do what I did before. So in the previous slide, I was focusing on prices. I was going for the cheapest voters. So now every voter has the same price. So it stands to reason that I go for the heaviest voter. Heaviest voters have most impact. So I go for the heaviest voter and I transfer, I pay one for him and I transfer his weight from C to P. And I do that until that candidate is no longer dangerous, until the weight of C is at most double, right? So kind of like in the previous slide, but now I focus on weights. And again, if this exceeds the budget, I fail. And if this gives P too much weight, I fail, right? And so if, supposing I'm not done, I still need to buy more weight for P, what do I do? Again, symmetrically with the previous slides, whom do I bribe now? I still need to buy more weight. 
So all voters have the same price but potentially different weights. Whom do I bribe? Heaviest, heaviest of the remaining bonds. Okay. Okay, so this is actually an algorithm, right? And there are no issues with its correctness, right? So this is actually perfectly correct. So what's wrong with it? Right, okay, so think of what these weights are. So these weights, so maybe I'm not bribing individual vote voters, I'm bribing sort of parties, or I'm bribing shareholders. So think of it as me bribing shareholders. Shareholders have different numbers of shares, which can be quite large. Right, so I'm bribing shareholders to transfer, their, to transfer the vote for a specific candidate. Now, a number of shares can be really large. So we think of those numbers as being given to us in binary. Right, so why is this problematic? Uh, okay, so in the way, yes, yeah, so this is, okay, so there will be some winning weight, vote weight W. Right, so if there is successful bribery, then in that bribery there is a weight W with which our guy wins. Right, so some W exists. But when I say guess here, so what do I mean by guess? I go over all possibilities. So when I said guess a score, there, there weren't that many possible scores. It was between 1 and N, so it was a factor of N. Right, so here when I say guess the winning vote weight, right, I'm going over all possible weights. If weights are given to me in binary, this is pseudo-polynomial but not polynomial. Right, this is actually expensive. Too many possibilities. Right, so I have to get around that. Okay, so, and in fact, it's actually not very difficult. So there's one small tweak. It's sort of subtle. So I'm, I don't necessarily expect that all of you will get it, but let me try to explain it anyway. Okay, so here's an observation. So what I was guessing was the winning vote weight for P. Right, and that's slightly difficult. So instead, I will be guessing a number W that is not quite that. I will be guessing W such that after bribery, the vote weight of every candidate R than P is at most W. So it's not necessarily the vote weight of P, but it's the maximum weight of a competitor of P. Right? So it may be that they all end up at the same level, or it may be that the maximum weight of the competitor is slightly less, but this is the quantity I'm going to be guessing. Right? And if I have a guess, not for the weight of P, but for this quantity, the algorithm from the previous slide goes in the same way. So I have to reduce the weights of everyone else to be at most Z, right? And I have to, to ensure that the weight of P is at least that, right? And then I succeed. So I can think of the number I'm guessing as this, right? And this, then this W becomes the maximum weight of a competitor. Now, under my algorithm, so what is, what is it that I do to the competitors? So I order the votes for the competitor in the order of weight, and I remove, and I start removing them from the heaviest to the lightest, right? So in the final outcome, there are only that many possibilities for the vote for the weight of each competitor. It can be his total weight, his total weight minus the weight of his heaviest supporter, his total weight minus the weight of his two heaviest supporters, etc. Right? So this quantity W defined in this way, right? So there are only so many possibilities for that. Right, so for each voter, for each competing voter, there are at most n possibilities, right? And I have to guess kind of which of these competitors provides this bound W. So it makes for kind of n times m roughly possible values. And I can figure out what these values are from the input. Right, so then there are actually not that many reasonable possibilities for W that I need to consider. Again, I'm being slightly informal here and it's, it's not completely trivial, but this is basically the argument. Right, so this is the argument from the original bribery paper. So if I do that, right, then I can actually run the algorithm from the previous slide. Okay, so that was bribery under plurality, general weights, unit prices. One case we didn't consider is general weights, general prices. Okay, so I need to buy, so okay, so what happens now is I need to buy voters who have weights and prices to achieve a certain weight for my candidate at a given price. Which problem does it remind you of? Knapsack, right? And of course, therefore, it's NP hard. Weakly NP hard, and in fact, so it's solvable and suitably normal time, but well, NP hard, no hope. Okay, so good that you observed it. Okay, so that was kind of bribery. So all of that is from the original kind of first bribery paper. So here are two fancier flavors of bribery. So both are defined in my paper with Piotr Pleshevsky. So both say, it's not exactly realistic to say that, you know, so maybe you can bribe a democratic, 
Maybe you can bribe, say, a Democratic voter in the UK to vote Labour over Liberal Democrats versus Liberal Democrats over Labour, but typically you cannot bribe them to vote Tories. Right? So some bribes are easier than others. Right? So in general, a small change is easier than a large change. Okay, so how do you model that? So one model we introduced is swap bribery, and swap bribery is incredibly fine-grained and sophisticated. So for each voter, and for every pair of candidates, you have a price for getting that voter to swap that pair of candidates if they're adjacent in his preferences. Right, and the idea is kind of at the first step, the voter would swap two adjacent guys, then some other swaps may become available. So in principle, he, to, he we may be able to transform his vote to any other vote, but at a price. And the price depends on which swaps we have performed, right? And then you can ask about kind of the complexity of accomplishing this or that under that model. Not surprisingly, it's NP card pretty much granitic. Okay, so a slightly less powerful version is shift bribery. Under shift bribery, we say, okay, we have our preferred candidate, so we cannot just ask our voters to do whatever we like. We cannot ask them to swap candidate C and candidate D just because but we can bribe them to shift our preferred candidate further up in their vote, right? And then the price depends on how much we want to shift, right? So for a given voter, there's a price to shift P one position up, two positions up, three positions up, etc. Okay, so why is shift bribery interesting? Well, it's because of a different perspective on bribery. So I present as a bribery, like literally someone going around offering people money to change their vote, right? And this is obviously sinister. But let's try to look at, Let's now try to think about it from the perspective of running a campaign manager for a candidate. Right, so suppose there's a candidate you want to support, you're running a campaign for them. So what do you do? Well, you reach out to people and try to convince them that your guy is great and potentially that other candidates are rubbish. Right? So what do you do to that? So you target certain groups of voters, voters with certain preferences, right? So you can run a very broad campaign, but you can also run a bro targeted campaign, a micro campaign, do something on Facebook. Right, and if you run a targeted campaign, maybe, uh, maybe you go out to groups of voters with very specific preferences, maybe just kind of one specific preference ranking, and you spend money on them to try to make them change their preferences. Right? So if you try to set up a mathematical model for that, that's exactly what we did in the previous slide, so bribery. Right, so maybe, okay, so maybe to be completely more realistic, you should be a bit more sophisticated. You should say that maybe once you pay, you bribe simultaneously a group of voters to do certain things because maybe you reach out to kind of several electorates with, you know, some diversity in their opinions. So there's a model for that as well called combinatorial bribery. But as a first step, this is a good approximation, right? So this is what campaign management does, right? And then the difference between shift bribery and swap bribery becomes meaningful. Shift bribery is you, uh, you campaign for your candidate. You try to get him further up in the preference order. Right? So you don't do any dirty tricks trying to convince voters about relative merits of other candidates. Swap bribery, you may also be campa campaigning by kind of telling voters how to compare other candidates in the hope that it helps your guy. Right? And this is somewhat dishonest and dirty campaign tactics, so shift bribery is probably kind of a better model for straightforward campaigning. Right? So these results are there for, you know, not just to help the bad guys to ruin your election, this is also to help reasonable guys to run the election campaigns. And kind of just one point to make here is that approximation algorithms for bribery become irrelevant, right? Because in practice, maybe you're allowed to overshoot your budget a bit if you, if you really accomplish your goal. So bribery that doesn't, that doesn't quite achieve what you do at a given budget, but at twice the budget, maybe something reasonable, right? So approximation algorithms for bribery are in fact interesting. Okay, so this is sort of, so there are plenty of papers on bribery with various flavors, with various computational complexity results. So include some approximation results. So there's a cute to approximation algorithm for bribery and the border, for instance. Lots of parameterized results. So it's significant literature. Obviously, I don't have time to cover it, but yeah, I can give you pointers. So the most natural point is the book chapter from the handbook on computational social choice. Right, so there's quite a bit of literature on that. Okay, so let me stop here. Thanks. So let's have a short break now, maybe even just five minute break, and then we'll do a tutorial session with some exercises. So is that okay with everyone? Okay. So five minutes just. <laughs> 